If I had to describe Nettie's music in just one word to someone, I would say it's heartbreaking. It's dark, depressing, and sometimes just downright weird, but you can never say that it, well, doesn't have a message to convey. Over the past decade, Nettie has managed to consistently deliver some of the most shocking music in the community. Not just from the quality or attention to detail he gives his songs, but from the subject matter as well. From war to suicide to school, most artists would try to pull themselves away from that type of subject matter the more popular they became. In an age where the public can literally cancel you without a second thought, saying even the slightest thing that could rub someone the wrong way could mean your whole career. But Nedu continues to put out some of the rawest songs in the community, regardless of how people see him. This is the story how a 17 year old boy with no background in music became the voice of a generation. Oshide P, or as he's better known these days as Nedu, is a bit different from the producers that I typically cover on this channel. Most of the time I'll talk about the producers who pioneered the scene. People who came into vocal aid at a time when there wasn't much of a foundation to work off of. When they were essentially the ones who had to figure out how they could create an audience from the sudden spike in popularity. But Nedu was a producer who came much later in the scene. His first breakout hit, Abstract Nonsense, wouldn't even be released until 2011. But if you look a decade later, he has quickly grown into one of the most popular producers of all time. At the end of the 2000s, Nedu had grown up in high school watching the vocal ace scene from a distance. And like many others who came before him and after, Nedu was motivated by the producers he saw on Nico Nico, and developed a strong desire to become like them. Although he was only 17 and had no background in music, he immediately brought his first guitar and started learning music theory in order to compose his own tracks. He says one of his biggest influences was the Vocaloid rock producer Buzz G. To this day, he considers Albino to be his favorite Vocaloid track too. It becomes clear very quickly looking at Nedu's work, not only in the beginning of his career, but even some of his biggest hits, that he was heavily influenced by the rock scene pioneered by people like Buzz G. Nedu's work has an aggressive style to it. He liked making music with high BPMs like Wawaka, and the lyrical intensity of Buzz G. But he could also pull back and make something simple and clean like Jimmy Thump P. From the end of 2009 to the end of 2010, Nettie would put out five separate tracks. They're not the greatest tracks I've ever heard, but they have the charm to them of someone who was clearly putting their heart into what they were doing. Unfortunately, shortly after that, he announced that he would be going on hiatus for his entrance exams at college. But over those short six months, those five songs that he posted would gain a cult following as he started accumulating hundreds of thousands of views. Nedu already felt rushed to get back into music after losing time to his exams, but after seeing that, I can only imagine how impatient he must have felt. And typically that would be a recipe for disaster, but I don't think a single person on that site, including its own creator, expected what happened next. Abstract Nonsense is one of the most drastic changes I have ever seen in the tone and direction of a producer's music, especially in such a short period of time. Not to say that Nedu's previous music was bad by any means, but when he returned from his hiatus there was a certain level of maturity in his work that just was non-existent before. Yes, obviously the overall tone of his music somehow found a way to get even darker, but a closer look shows an artist whose work was so much more polished. The production of Abstract Nonsense on its own was on a whole new level. The guitar riff immediately drew you in the moment you hit that play button. The tuning was complex and varied, leading to a vocal delivery that carefully changed to give it the punch and weight it needed during key moments of the song. The mixing was absolutely gorgeous. The bland and obvious computer-generated drums of his previous work were now gone. Instead you had these hard-hitting drums that perfectly complemented the aggressive nature of the vocals in the lead guitar. If you want to know why producers like Nedu grew to have such a massive audience in such a little amount of time, it's because they understood their mistakes and instead of ignoring them, they grew from them. Stagnation was never an option, and you can literally see the progression in every single song that he put out. The true success of Abstract Nonsense wasn't the views, it wasn't the popularity the song achieved, it was the fact that Nedu had found who he was as an artist. He was not only experienced, but smarter. Darker, but more focused. He could cleverly execute a song with a sound that no one else had the ability to replicate. And no song proved this more than his follow-up Tokyo Teddy Bear. It was a song that took the scene by storm at the time. The bass was dark and gritty, the vocals were isolated and melancholic in tone, the way the instrumental pulls back during the bridge leaving just that waning guitar, 
only to just throw everything back into your face once the chorus hits is just absolutely genius. At the time, this was the first song in the scene that I had ever hear incorporate an organ too. In fact, off the top of my head, I can't even think of any other songs that do. At this point, Neru had shown that he was a producer to be feared. He wasn't another one-hit wonder, he was someone with staying power. And if I dare say, he made something timeless. Not only do I still hear Tokyo Teddy Bear play today, but I'll listen to tracks like Chronicles of Wind's Noise or Human Disqualification, and think, yeah, these sound like songs from a decade ago. But Tokyo Teddy Bear? If you told me that song came out in 2013, 2017, or even last year, I would believe you. It just baffles me that he still has one more song that's arguably more iconic than this. Depending on your background and situation, Japan can be one of the most welcoming and humbling environments to be in, but it can also be one of the most punishing. It's a society focused on group mentality instead of the individual mindset we have in the West. Education is no different. When your child succeeds in school, the mindset is that the family has succeeded as well. Children are taught from a young age to persist towards a goal. It's even considered more important to try hard and to not give up on your dreams than to actually achieve that goal. Now is that a good mindset? I mean of course, you can't get anywhere in life without hard work, so good on them. But in my opinion, it feels like a huge contradiction. Let me explain. Japan is an exam-heavy school system. Starting from elementary school, you study your butt off for entrance exams to get into a good middle school. From there you go to school for another three years only to take another entrance exam. And after that? Yep, you got it. Another entrance exam just to get into college. Until you graduate and finally get a job. But that's such a huge amount of pressure to put on a kid. And to make matters worse, those entrance exams really do mean everything. How is it fine for a kid not to reach their goals when you have all that pressure put on them? And the pressure of making their family look bad on top of it. And even then, 40% of those kids still won't test well enough to get into their first choice. For someone like me over in the States, if I was just purely on my SAT scores alone for example, I most definitely would not have made it into my university. But it's not just about exams over here. Colleges take into account your GPA, your background, even your extracurricular activities too. I can't imagine how unbearably stressful it must be for those kids growing up. I would probably spend all my weekends in a cram school too if I knew my exams were going to determine my whole future. Nedu's The Lost One Weeping is no different than a social commentary on the state of the education system. How it crushes the dreams of kids, and the constant stress and unfair standards that it sets for its students. Sure, it's a catchy and well-produced song just like any of his other tracks, but the difference here, or rather the genius behind the song, is its relatability. Regardless of your nationality or your academic background, you can connect with what Nedu is saying. I don't need to be a kid growing up in Japan to understand the fear or anxiety that comes from being a student. The pressure that comes from the people around me to accede at what I'm doing. The way it crushes the dreams of students. But whether if it was intentional or not, Nedu's music was relatable to anyone who has simply just gone through puberty, which made his music that much more powerful. As strange as it sounds, Nedu's music reminds me a lot of George Orwell's 1984. You can put together some striking parallels between the imagery on tracks like Jailbreak for example. The use of a city surrounded in glass is very reminiscent to me of the concept of the three super states discussed in that book. The harmony and dark grays of the uniforms of the soldiers in the music video reminds me of the Thought Police. And then from a writing standpoint, you also have a similar distaste for war and how emotional it becomes for the soldiers, like on FPS. In the same way that George Orwell wrote 1984 as a warning for the public against dictatorships and war, Nedu's music serves for this generation as a voice of warning for the youth against carelessly accepting the pressures or limitations that society tries to put on us. But what separates Nedu from normal critics of social structures and society as a large is his versatility. Let's skip forward to present day. The Nedu of today is much different from the Nedu we knew 10 years ago. The cold and dark tones of his earlier work is now bright and vibrant. The aggressive garage band sound of his earlier work is now replaced by an interesting blend of rock, pop, and electric music. But I'm actually a big fan of Nedu's change in direction starting with his album Cynicism. A rather fitting title as we'll see in a bit. I thought My Name Is Love Song was okay, but it felt like more of a world domination except less focused. But Cynicism felt like a true evolution of his work, like an artist taking a risk and doing something no one else ever thought of doing in the scene. But one thing that definitely didn't change was the message. Don't let the bright lights or the chains and sound trick you. This is very much the same Nedu as before, the same boy who loves to give us his perspective on everyday life. Just more mischievous than before. 
While evading rock is a clear stance against the current state of society and our obsession with information, the way we'll blindly follow what people tell us behind our screens and ignore our surrounding environments. Or you might even say it's a statement from Nedu about how society looks at him and many creators for that matter. People like Nedu spend a good portion of their time within a closed off space, spending countless hours in front of a screen. Even though they work just as hard as anyone else with a 9 to 5 job, they're looked down on as hikikomoris just because they don't go to an office every day wearing a suit and tie, with a coffee in one hand and a briefcase in the other. Cynicism as a whole is an album that's focused on exploring how society masks its problems using social media, and how technology has morphed us. You don't have to go outside and face your problems anymore. Instead, you can just spend them in a closed off space behind a screen if you want gratification. Someone can very easily paint this picture that their life is great using things like Instagram and Facebook, but it could all just be a ploy to gain popularity, to create this artificial love or to fight insecurity. I think Bo Burnham painted a solution for it very well on his comedy show Make Happy a few years back. I know very little about anything, but what I do know is that if you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. Gaining a few likes or gaining popularity are not things that can make you happy. It'll only make things worse. It's easy to listen to tracks like Snobism or whatever, 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 and to dismiss Neru as some sort of anarchist. But I really think it's more than that. I think it's a cynic's way of warning people of their attachment to these artificial or meaningless apps, instead of the relationships we already have surrounding us. My relationship with Neru and his music is complicated. I won't sit here and pretend that I think the main reason he puts these messages in his music is because he wants to be a knight in shining armor for people, but I do think there are value in his words and that self-venting that he puts into his music, he very much realizes how relatable it is. But that's always been something that comes second to him, almost like a lucky coincidence. But if anything, isn't that better? Let me tell you something that I think not even Neru realizes. His work was and always will be relatable to his audience. Why? Because when it comes to therapy, I don't think we necessarily want someone like Superman or Oprah to deal with our problems. Growing up, I used to hear, always use bleach and glow, but you'd have okay. to have about 300,000 right. gallons. To okay, number the, one, this is the situation. Yes. I have a skin disorder that destroys the pigmentation of the skin. It's something that I cannot help. Because it makes us feel bad about ourselves, like we're lesser people compared to them. Whether we realize it or not, we naturally reflect ourselves on the opposite party. Sometimes the best therapy isn't seeing a professional or finding the nicest person you know. We just want that empathy. We want someone who's been there before, someone who's hit those lowest of lows. And in that way, that's how Neru became a voice for this generation. Because after all, we're just all human, right? Thanks for watching.